so yeah, I mean, the explorer that's always most fascinated me. And I think they're probably the explorer who um, whose story bears the most relevance to going to Mars is probably, I guess, Ernest Shackleton, uh, isn't it? And so, um, like the the environments we find that mimic Mars most closely on Earth, they're all in Antarctica. So, and I've always wanted to go to Antarctica as well. Like, I'd love to go to Antarctica. Just so happens that going to Antarctica is very expensive, you know. Uh, you can't really go to Antarctica unless you've got a good reason to go to Antarctica. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I hear, like, what I hear about Antarctica is that it's incredibly quiet. Like, it's eerily and ethereally quiet. And that's what I really want to, to experience, I think. And, um, yeah, just to see, like, the, the end of the world, <laughs> you know what I mean? The pole, well, not, you never see the pole. I mean, I suppose you could go down to the pole, couldn't you? It's down to the South Pole, um, where that uh, ice cube experiment is, the one looking for dark matter um, down the South Pole. I suppose you could go there. And, um, like, that's, that's like, going to be an example of, of a mission that, uh, it... In terms of exploration, it, like it didn't yield us much, not really. Like what it what it did for us is um, oh, 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 oh. is I mean, what do we have at the black at the um, South Pole now? We we have um, you know, a, a research station down there. And that's it. <laughs> but was it worth going? Therefore, like was it worth a manned exploration down to the South Pole? Like, at that point in human history, that was the furthest someone had ever been from a civilization. It was the furthest into sort of the unknown that we'd been. And I think like whether or not we gain prospect and whether or not we gain utility from conquering a new bit of terrain or, you know, um, learning how to live in an increase or a, diff, a newer and more harsh environment or newer, more hostile environments. Like what the upshot of that is, it is is that it always makes us uh, more resilient and better able to survive, more capable of surviving. This is this is the big utility with doing something like exploring Mars or colonizing Mars. We, you know, the peoples of Mars in the future. I mean, I don't know whether or not they'll be like. Earth Mars relations, or whether or not you know it would be more of an open system of free travel between the two. That's um, you know, Mars might be a station for all sorts of things, so like you know, it's the, it's the war planet, it might be partly a military base, I imagine, or possibly you know, for protecting the solar system. Uh, you know, um, if we're going to mine for resources, craft mining for resources may need protection. Otherwise, you could end up with kind of uh, war breaking out or piracy or various other things when there's valuable commodities and expensive equipment of any description. I guess you need defense involved in that process. Also, um, you know, no weapons of mass destruction, sure. But perhaps we should be thinking about yeah, some ordnance or some weaponry of minimal destruction in space, you know. And, um, or, you know, um, devices for, say, like, restraining hostile craft, uh, like tractor beams or something, um, yeah, and this sort of thing. And perhaps even some small arms to defend ourselves up there. Um, if it, you know, if it's... <laughs> If it devolves into some sort of corporate free for all, which I hope it wouldn't, and that hopefully we could all be on the same page in terms of who gets first dibs over the prospects um, in various regions of the solar system, right? So you'd have, like, on the one hand, I suppose, the resources of the asteroid belt, and then the the mineral reserves of the outer solar system. Uh, Mars, as I understand it, isn't all that minerally rich. So you'd need, I think, probably to pump nitrogen into its atmosphere somehow to, um, when you grow things, prevent, uh, you know, all the oxygen therefore released into the atmosphere just combusting. <laughs> when it's heated too much, when you spark a match, or when it's exposed to a spark. The atmosphere is burning away. Um, 
It's not ideal, really, is it? But yeah, I mean, I reckon Mars could be terraformed with um, by sustaining fusion reactions in space around Mars. And yeah, there's a huge amount of opportunity in space, I think, if we focus on it. And it will become increasingly relevant in the future, I'm fairly certain. Um, because it has the, the technology that gets developed up there, that that all ends up uh, pushing things uh, in a in a well, forward on Earth, <laughs> doesn't it? You know, we get computers this way, we get uh, mobile phones this way, we get um, uh, satellites this way, we get GPS this way. We get, you know, Teflon even this way, famously, and all, and other things, what have you. Hydroponics, likely, also. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting like notion, like to really kind of embrace technology and really try and see where it takes us, rather than distrusting it. I think, and. It was like one, one motive for going to Mars. Like, the central motive would be like it's strategically the most intelligent thing to, we could do. I think to try and occupy more than one planet. It that's the basis of my logic behind it, rather than just the sort of romantic ex spirit of the explorer or whatnot. That is also a motivation of mine, but that's a personal motivation. The uh, the expedience of doing so, or the exigence thing <clears throat> that underlies the whole endeavour is survival, really. It's, it's the survival of our species. It's survival of the fittest, you know, the fittest either physically or mentally you know, the, the most cunning, the most uh, the most intelligent, you know, the most, it is the most intelligent or the most adept at surviving. This is clear. This is clear from, you know, that what what our digits firstly give us the capabilities of being able to do, you know, uh, read books and <laughs> craft computers and, you know, all this stuff that we take for granted. <laughs> But um, shouldn't really, I don't think. Um, I should respect the technology. Try to like, use computers and things like this. Probably gonna stop just churning them out all the time. Though. But possibly can't now. Computer research just a tiny bit. Um, but yeah, getting everything into space would be fantastic. You know, giving our Civilization, well, putting really our civilization into a new stage of civilization and, you know, thereby becoming more effective survivors, more effective in the game of evolution. Because, we, you know, we're not putting all our eggs on, on, in the one basket of this planet. We're spreading our eggs into different baskets around the solar system, firstly, and the rest of the galaxy after that, we'd hope. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I suggest, like, this is, this is a very, very... Expedient, sensible thing to do. It's the most rational course of action if we want to survive to the future. Or we don't want to survive, you know, we, and we want the end of the world. We want, um, you know, the, the inevitable Armageddon scenario, which I mean, will happen, I think, with asteroids more than likely, unless we, we really up our game in space again with technology up there to shoot them down. You know, uh, carbon fiber tipped nukes that burrow into the asteroids for enough to, to you know, give it optimum destructive capability to the nuke and destroy the asteroid before it hits the planet, and so on and so forth. And this sort of thing, we need it. We do need to do more stuff in space, and like with fusion and yada yada yada, so on. Continues, same thing. <laughs>